Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, so today we are covering Diptera carp ID 101. So um, it's a whole family of trees that's gonna be, um, we're gonna go step by step via, um, we're gonna try and like explain um, to eat to general level. And today that will be covered by Tashwini. So we'll do our best to try and cover each one. Um, and we'll give some examples of each to each species as well. So Tashini, whenever you're ready to start, go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Tashwini and welcome to the world of Diptera Cup. So briefly about myself. Um, in the past, I completed my education in University Putra Malaysia in Bintulu. University Science Malaysia in Penang and Shen Istvan Agiatem in Budapest. I studied forestry, biology, and horticulture. I've also had past experiences um, with sampling plywood in Kuala Baram, Sabah Parks in Penampang, Frim in Kepong, the Penang Botanical Gardens in Penang, etc. So for today's presentation, um, what you will be learning is to know what is dipterocarp. And then you'll be um, introduced uh, with different ways to recognize a dipterocarp uh, tree. And I'll briefly go through what is the tropical rainforest and what kind of different ecosystems exist within this tropical rainforest. I'll give you six reasons why dip the dipterocarp trees are so special. And I'll go through some important leaf, fruit, and flower terms that we should uh, understand as we go along the presentation. And then I'll go um, gener in general, um, the physical characteristics of diptera cup trees, and then um, into details of the physical characteristics that you can find in each uh, genus of the diptera uh, plant group. So after this uh, presentation, you'll be able to recognize a diptera cup tree you'll be able to differentiate between uh, the different genus uh, that belongs to this uh, dipterocarp plant group. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, ID some easy to ID dipterocarp species or to ID some common uh, dipterocarp species. So what is dipterocarp? So dipterocarp is a plant group and um, uh, scientifically, we call this uh, plant group as Dipterocarpaceae. So this is the family. Um, so very quickly, you have the big plant group. And as you go along, you have different classifications to narrow down a tree to a specific species. So you give a specific Latin name to this species because this species has its own uh, unique characteristics. So for this presentation, what you have to understand is the family, so Dipterocarpaceae. And then you have subfamily, tribe, subtribe to narrow down the classification. But you don't have to remember this, just remember genus. So this is the second classification after family. And then you have subgenus section, which uh, is not important for today's presentation, but you have to know species. So you have the family, genus, and species. Around the world for Dipterocarpaceae, there are 17 uh, genera, but in Malaysia, there are 10 genera. So uh, when you look at a Dipterocarp tree, um, in order to identify them, you first have to look um, at different uh, physical characteristics. So some of them are the fruit. So the fruits usually have wings, like in the first photo, but of course not all uh, fruits of dipterocups have wings. Then you look at the trunk. So the texture on the outer surface, they are quite uh, distinct uh, and they are uh, of various types. And then you look at the substance that is being uh, given out by the tree trunk. And this liquidy substance, they will solidify. As you can see in the photo, it's quite yellowish. And when you burn this substance, it gives out a very good aroma. And then you look at the leaf. So you look at the leaf arrangement. You look at the venation that runs along the, the leaf. So one example is um, if you look at this leaf, it's of a vatica species. At the end of the secondary veins, you can see tiny dots. These are oil glands. Another example is another Vatica species, uh, Vatica flavida. You can see the tiny dots. This is the oil gland at the end of the secondary venation. So you can recognize, okay, this is a Vatica species. Vatica is a genus of uh, Dipterocarpaceae. 
Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, the world map and the green highlighted areas represent uh, areas which experience the tropical climate. So in these areas, you can find the tropical rainforest. Malaysia falls um, in between one degree to seven degree north longitude. So that is why we experience the tropical climate and we have the tropical rainforest. And um, out of these areas, uh, these shaded areas represent the areas where you can find dipterocarp trees. So you can find dipterocarp trees from South America to the African continent to many areas in Asia. And what I would like to highlight here is in the peninsular Malaysia and in Borneo as a whole, you, find, you can find uh, relatively the highest number of uh, dipterocarp uh, species. Okay, so out of this, uh, the tropical rainforest, you find different types of uh, ecosystems. Some examples are like uh, beach forest, mangrove forest, mountain forest, etc. And in almost all these different ecosystems, you will most definitely find a dipterocarp tree. For example, in a peat swamp forest, you find Shoya rugosa. And in a hill dipterocarp forest, so hill dipterocarp forest um, is the forest type that you categorize from 300 to 800 meters uh, in altitude. So in this uh, forest type, you find Shoya Kurtisi, and it's very easy to spot Shoya Kurtisi from afar because when you look at a Shoya tree from, Shoya Kurtisi tree from far, you see that the canopy is a bit uh, bluish, grayish like. So when you look at this crown, you can instantly know, okay, this is Shoya Kurtisi. So from uh, 300 to 800 meters is the hill dipterocarp. Below 300 is the lowland dipterocarp and above 800, so from 800 to 1,300 meters in altitude is the upper dipterocarp forest. And in this uh, forest type, uh, it's quite rare to find dipterocarp trees, but if you do find, then you will find Shoya platyclados, which is Maranti Bukit and Hopia Montana and etc. So this is the example uh, of the uh, bluish, grayish like uh, leaves of Shoya Kurtisi. So here you can see it's a bit um, grayish, purplish. Okay, so um, there are six reasons why this plant group uh, is so special. The first one is the dominance of the family Dipterocarpaceae. So in our rainforest, this family is the most dominant family. And this is of course true if our forests are left uh, undisturbed. And these trees, they can grow very tall. So they grow above the canopy layer. So above 30 meters in the forest. So they grow from 40 to 70 meters in height. And some even grow more than 70 meters. As you can see in the photo uh, at the top, this is uh, Shoya Fagutiana. This is the tallest uh, tropical tree in the world. It is in Danum Valley. But this photo was not taken in Danum Valley. It was taken in Tawau. So this Shoya Fagutena used to be the tallest tropical tree in the world, but now of course, um, the newly uh, discovered Shoya Fagutena in Danu Valley is the tallest tropical tree in the world. Secondly, uh, this family it dominates the world timber trade because it's a very important uh, economical source. So 50% of dipterocarp wood is uh, commercialized. So they are commercialized for different uses, um, for construction, etc. So in Malaysia, we classify our timber class according to heavy hardwood, medium hardwood, and light hardwood. So heavy hardwood trees like Cheng, the Chengal tree, near Barana Carpus Hemi, is very durable. So it's used to make poles, okay? And for light hardwood, for example, Maranti Pute, um, this type of wood is used to make uh, walls or furniture, etc. The photo on the right uh, is an incomplete uh, species list of a uh, plywood factory uh, to manufacture plywood. So um, 13 out of 54 species in this list belong to the dipterocarp um, tree group. Okay, so the third reason um, of um, why dipterocarp is so special is because of masting. But before that, let me explain this uh, story. So dipterocarp trees, they have a reproduction rate because of two factors. The first is because of poor seed dispersal. So the seeds, uh, when they drop from the mother tree, from the canopy, they don't fall off too far away from the mother tree because they are relatively heavy because the, the composition of the fruit is uh, mostly wood. So that is why they fall mostly around 60 meters around the mother tree. Secondly, um, the seeds, once they land on the forest floor, 
they are quickly eaten up by rats, by ants, because the seed has a relatively high oil content. But the saving grace is they have this uh, unique characteristic of musting. So let's look uh, one by one. So poor seed dispersal, um, as you can see in this uh, video, when they uh, fall from the mother tree, even though they have wings, um, they don't uh, get carried away by the wind uh, too far away from the mother tree. And this is uh, Shoya Laprosula. So once it uh, lands on the forest floor, ants quickly build a nest around the fruit and they start to eat, eat up the, the seeds. But uh, there is this uh, event called masting. So masting is the production of large seed crops at intervals of several years. Meaning, for example, after five years, this uh, special species of uh, dipterocarp in a habitat, they start to produce flowers at the same time. So you get um, beautiful videos like this. This was taken by Mr. Patrick in the Rawang Bypass. So this happens simultaneously. You can see the canopy in the color that it produces. So beautiful. Okay, more photos. So you can look at the canopy and you can identify, okay, this uh, is flowering. Okay, this diagram on the left um, are some examples of uh, Shoya species. So Shoya is a genus and then you have different species. So you see that uh, the flower buds, they develop uh, from a few weeks to a few months. And then once the flower buds are developed, flowering period starts for a few weeks and then the fruits uh, start to develop um, for a few months. And in general, in Malaysia, we say that the flowering period is from January to March and the fruit, fruiting period is from May to July. And uh, we also say the flowering happens once every five years. But of course, this is very dependent on the species, on the climatic changes, and also on the microclimate of a certain habitat. For example, Shura leprosula, on average, um, they flower once every two years, and Shura kutisi, uh, on average, um, every year. In this diagram of a Shoya, uh, of a Shoya species, um, the bar graph represents um, the flowering periods. So these species are flowers every two to seven years. And in between, they flower very little or none at all. But uh, what I want to show you is the, the peaks, so the, the bar graphs with the highest number of flowering. This happens in, during the El Nino season. So when the trees, they start to feel an unusual climate, they start to switch on their survival instinct. So they start to flower at a very uh, huge amount to make sure that uh, this reproduction will prolong their generation. Next reason why they are so special is because of endemism. So endemism is the locality of a species to a certain geographical range. Um, for example, if I say near Banana Corpus Hemi, the Chang'an tree is endemic to Southern Thailand, Peninsular Malaysia, and Singapore, then if you find this tree in Australia, it means that this tree was being introduced to Australia, but it's not endemic to Australia because the locality or the endemism is only uh, restricted to these three areas. And if I say, for example, uh, Nasiloma is endemic to Malaysia and maybe Singapore, and if you find Nasiloma in England, then it means that Nasiloma was being introduced to England, but it is always endemic to uh, Malaysia and also uh, Singapore. So another example is uh, Shoya Kutisi. Uh, if you find Shoya Kutisi in a habitat, so Shoya Kutisi, Shoya Kutisi, Shoya Kutisi in a habitat, so it's a population, and then 10 kilometers away, maybe you find Shoya Kutisi, Shoya Kutisi, Shoya Kutisi. So in a different habitat of a different population, and over the centuries, they start to uh, evolve and they start to develop uh, beautiful, long, silky leaves, the long limbs, they grow taller. And after many, many, many years, this population A, they evolve into a new species and population B evolves into a different species. So that is why um, diptorocarp trees, they have a very high level of endemism because of this small geographical range. Because as I mentioned, the 
fruits when they drop from the mother tree they don't go too far away from the mother tree so they are just in this small uh, perimeter if you look at the uh, diagram on the right diptera carpaceae family uh, in the malaysia region so malaysia region encompasses uh, malaysia the philippines indonesia and some other countries in asia in this malaysia region the number of species found uh, is 386, but the endemic species are 346 out of 386. So this is 90% uh, percentage of endemism that we can find in the Malaysia region, which is very, very high. And what I would like to explain here is, um, so in Diptero Carpase, you have um, different genera. And so here you can see there is Upuna bernensis and Neobarna corpus hemi. So Upuna, the, ge the genus Upuna has only one species. So there's only Upuna bernensis. This means that this genus is monotypic because there are no other species. The same thing happens with Neobarna corpus. Neobarna corpus is also monotypic because there is only one species. There is only Neobarna corpus hemi or the Chengal tree. Upuna bernensis is endemic to Borneo. So you don't find Upuna bornensis in the Peninsula Malaysia. Neobarana carpus hemi is endemic uh, to Peninsula Malaysia, so you don't find Neobarana carpus hemi in Borneo. Okay, the fifth reason is um, they are not only eaten by different animals, they are also loved by humans. So we um, process the, uh, the seed of Shoya macrophylla to turn into butter. And I heard that this butter, when you eat with uh, steaming rice, is really, really good. Uh, the sixth reason why this group is so special is because of the raisin that it produces. So this is a few. Um, dry balanops, the couple uh, genus, is very famous for this. Um, and in India, uh, many people burn this uh, raisin in their houses uh, to produce a good aroma. Okay, now let's uh, go through some important uh, terms for leaves. So you see a leaf, and then you see the line that goes through the middle uh, of the leaf. This is the midrib. And then you have lines that go from the midrib to the edge of the leaf, so the margin of the leaf. This is called the secondary veins. And then you have the petiole, the stalk that holds the leaf. Uh, next is for flower and fruit. So you see um, the sepal or calyx. So this is the greenish part that is located at the bottom of the petal. So the petal is the whitish uh, color that you see. When the fruits start to develop, the petals will drop off. The interior part will develop into the fruit and the calyx or the sepal, the greenish part, will develop into the wings of the fruit. Okay, now that you know all the useful terms, we can start with the first characteristic uh, of a dipterocarp uh, tree. So this is very general uh, characteristic because this does not apply to all the species, of course. So the first one is paired stipule. This is found in many dipterocarp trees. Stipule here means it's an enclosure, a protective enclosure that uh, has the baby leaves. So when the baby leaves starts to start to emerge and grow, this paired stipule will be um, located at the at each side of the leaf. When the stipules drop off, they leave a scar around the branch or petiole. The photo on the left of Shoria. Um, uh, this Shoya species, uh, you can still see the stipule, even though the leaves have grown uh, into a big, uh, beautiful uh, size. So the stipules are still there watching over the leaf. Uh, the photo on the right uh, of Shoya acuminata, this is a characteristic stipule that looks like a baby cockroach. So if you look at this stipule next time, you will know that, okay, it belongs to Shoya acuminata. Next characteristic is simple leaf. Okay, simple leaf means that there is the leaf bud, and then when the baby leaf start, starts to emerge, there's only one leaf, so this is simple leaf. But if there is the leaf bud and many leaves start to emerge at the same time, so a group of leaves, you call this compound leaf. So this is one of the most important characteristics that you have to understand because dipterocarps they have simple leaf. Uh, but to really differentiate simple and compound leaf, it will take a lot of practice. So you, like, you have to really go through this to be able to differentiate simple and compound leaf. Next is the uh, secondary uh, venation. So they are mostly pinnate uh, opposite um, that looks almost opposite, but it's not exactly opposite. So if you see this, then you know that this might belong to a dipterocarp uh, tree group. 
Uh, next is uh, this uh, petiole that has a band like me. So you can see in this photo. And then when you look at the trunk, for example, for Dipterocarpus, uh, the genus Dipterocarpus, they have quite scaly um, bark, so the uh, trunk. And for some Shoria species, you can find this uh, scaly texture. But for Shoria, they are famously known for their fissured uh, texture. So fissured means uh, cuts into the trunk. And some Shoria have deep uh, fissures, so very deep cuts into the trunk. For Dryabaranops, Oblongifolia, and Aromatica, so the couple trees, they have a shaggy texture. So this is like a paper, paper being uh, torn off. Next is the calyx or the sepal, the greenish part. So there are around two to five that will eventually form the wings of the fruit. Okay, this is um, for the seed. The seed is categorized as recalcitrant and intermediate. So the meaning of this is um, the seeds are quite sensitive. They cannot be stored for a very long time um, because um, the seeds, they cannot lose a certain percentage of the moisture level. So if they pass this moisture level, the seeds are not viable anymore for germination. So that is why when you collect uh, dipterocarp cup seeds for germination, you have to germinate them quickly and you cannot store them in your storeroom for a very long time because Malaysia is a warm, warm country and um, they tend to lose moisture in a fast, fast way. Next is the petal. There are around uh, five petals on the flowers. Okay, the fruit, um, so the wings, and then you have the fruit. So the fruits are woody pericarp and inside these pericarps, you can find the seed. There is one seed. Uh, the raisin, as I mentioned before, um, this substance is given out by the tree. They come in various colors, yellowish, whitish, translucent. So translucent is found in the Hopia genus, etc. And the way the, the, the raisin flow and aggregate is also different. Like, at the photo at the bottom is of a Shoya species. So this racing they accumulate like in a mound. So uh, talking about Shoya, so Shoya is a genus and it has so many species that people always confuse this particular Shoya genus. So um, for Shoya, before you get to the species, you have to first classify uh, according to sections, subsections, and then you get to species because there are so many species and uh, scientists, they. Uh, arrange them uh, accordingly uh, in order to ID them better. Um, so the common uh, groups that we classify before the species are like Meranti Paang, Meranti Mera, Meranti um, Dama Hitam, Balau, etc. But um, a useful tip here, so before you get into these different classifications, when you see Shoya, when you recognize a Shoya tree, the first thing that you have to do is characterize them according to Maranti, the Maranti group or the Balau group. So uh, when you have a Shoya leaf, so I have a Shoya leaf here, you fold the leaf um, backwards, okay? And then you open up the leaf and then you look at the uh, top of the leaf. And if you see a whitish line, so this is the resin. So of course the resin is not only found in the trunk, it's found in the whole tree. And if you see this whitish line, this means that this, uh, Shoya species belong to the Balau group. So if you don't see this white line, it means it belongs to the Maranti group. So once you categorize like this, you can eliminate, okay, so this is Balau group. I eliminate all the species that belong to the Maranti group. And now I can only focus on the Balau group. So it's better to ID this way. And this is Shoya Roxburghi, uh, by the way. Okay, so I'm done with the phys general physical characteristics. Some very specific examples are like, for Shoya macroptera, if you cut the outer bark and you look at the inner bark, the color will be reddish. And for the, ge the genus Anisoptera, if you cut the outer bark and you look at the inner bark and you start to touch the inner bark, the texture is a bit like uh, layered, so it's not smooth. So it's like staircase and we call this lamina. For Dryobalanops, the genus uh, Dryobalanops, the kapo trees, it's very distinct uh, for its uh, kapo smell. So when you crush the leaves, you can immediately smell the kapo smell. And in Malaysia, it's quite known that we use this as the minyak kayu kapo for different uses. Okay, now let's start with um, how to diagnostic each uh, genus. So there are 10 genera, as I mentioned. And what is important here is uh, Neobaranocarpus, as I mentioned, it's, um, 
it's found in Peninsular Malaysia and Upuna is found in Borneo. So nine genera in the peninsula and nine in Borneo. The first one is dry balanops, so the couple trees. So the, this genus, they have five open wings, as you can see in the photo. And of course, some have no wings. The leaf, the margin, the edge of the leaf, it's smooth. And the secondary veins, they are parallel type. So this kind of vein, it's called dry balanite type. And the tree trunk, they are shaggy, uh, like paper being torn off. And they have this distinct campo oil smell. Some examples are dry balanops aromatica and dry balanops uh, oblongifolia. If you look at the photo at the top, you can see the crown of dry balanops aromatica. So you can see the gaps between uh, the canopy of different trees. This is because um, there is this phenomena known as crown shyness that these uh, trees do. So when the neighboring branches touch each other, they start to, uh, there will be friction and then the branches will drop off. So that is why there is always a gap between uh, different uh, trees uh, in the canopy. Okay, more examples of dry balanops uh, aromatica. You can see the open wings. Okay, you can see the parallel uh, veins in these three different species and the uh, wings, of course. Um, okay, and this is more parallel veins with five wings. Next is Hopia. Okay, for this uh, genus, uh, you look at the uh, base of the trunk. So you see thin buttress, which is um, root that goes from the trunk all the way to the ground. So this root is attached to the trunk. So it's called buttress. And then there are also steel roots. So steel roots are not attached to the trunk. So they just go from the trunk all the way to the ground. The fruits, they are small and they have long, um, outer uh, calyx and also the inner ones, uh, but they are shorter. The resin of Hopia, they are known as cat-eyed resin or diamond because of the shape of the resin, as you can see in the top photo. Some examples are Hopia ferrier and Hopia aptera. Okay, for Hopia, um, before you get to species level, there are different classifications of the sections and subsections, but for today's presentation, I'll just briefly go um, and explain uh, these two uh, sections. So for section dry balanites, the vein of the leaf, they look like dry balanops, so like couple leaves. So they are parallel. This is known as dry balanite. And some are also sub dry balanite, meaning they are sub almost parallel. Like as you can see in this photo of Hopia baccariana, the veins are long shot, long shot, not parallel to each other, as you would find in a dry balanop uh, leaf. In section Hopia, the leaf vein is not uh, as the one you would find in section dry balanites because the leaf vein is clariform like. So the normal leaf vein and it's not uh, parallel to each other, not even uh, sub parallel. Okay, it's the tree of Hopia baccariana. Okay, the next genus is Dipterocarpus. Okay, for Dipterocarpus, um, you will find two dominant wings on the fruit, as you can see in the photo. And almost all species of this genus, they have zinc-like uh, leaf. So if you can see the bottom photo, the margin of the leaf is zinc-like, the texture is zinc-like. And the fruit wings, they pop up, as you can see in the top photo. Some examples are Dipterocarpus grandiflorus and Dipterocarpus confertus. Okay, this is uh, more examples. You can see the margin of the leaf. It's zinc-like. This is Deuterocarpus verrucosus. And then you see the two dominant wings of Deuterocarpus rigidus. And you see the zinc-like um, margin of, uh, dip of Deuterocarpus oblongifolius. And then, yeah, more examples of the two dominant wings. And yeah, okay. So the next uh, genus is Anisoptera. So Anisoptera, the fruits, they are similar to Dipterocarpus, but the difference is on the uh, wings, uh, you see three obvious veins. 
And for anisoptera in the Greek language, anisos means unequal and pteron means wing. So when you look at the wings of anisoptera, they are unequal in, in, in the size. They have obvious buttress um, and they have this uh, special uh, venation called the looping margin vein. So you find this type of venation in anisoptera and also in cotylelobium genus, which will be which I'll be covering after this. So looping margin vein means that the secondary vein, just at, as it goes from the midrib and right before it reaches the uh, margin, the vein will start to loop and join together with the neighboring secondary vein. So along the leaf margin, you find these nice uh, loops. Um, another uh, characteristic is the petiole, it's swollen. And then if you look underneath the leaf, uh, there are these uh, scales. And so it's like hair. And then you have a uh, fissured bark. So it's like cuts into the trunk. So the texture of the bark is fissured. Okay, more diagram examples and more characteristic. So you can see the loop uh, veins on the diagram. And the shape of the leaves, they are mostly oblong above it, as you can see in the diagram. The veins uh, on the wings, there are three uh, obvious veins. And underneath the leaf, you can see this yellowish brownish like color because of the scales. Okay. Okay, next is cotylelobium. So cotylelobium, this genus, um, most of the trees have buttress roots. And as I mentioned, they have this special venation of looping margin like anisoptera, but the leaf uh, shape is not oblong above it, but it's oblong. The leaves are coriaceous, meaning the leaves are thick, rough, and leathery. And the calyx, as you can see in the photo uh, of the fruits, they are half open. Some examples are Cotylelobium melanoxylon and Cotylelobium bulky. If you can see in this photo, you can see the uh, oblong shaped leaf and also the secondary venation, which is a uh, loop looping margin. Next is uh, Neobaranocarpus. So Neobaranocarpus, the Chengal tree, there is uh, Neobaranocarpus hemi. Um, these trees, they have buttress roots and they have quite blackish uh, trunk. And if you look at the photo of the leaf and when you flick, so I have a um, leaf of Chengal here with me. If you flick, if you flick, I don't know if you can hear me, but if you flick the leaf, the sound of the leaf is like uh, flicking a brand new RM10 note. Yeah, it's the same. But if you flick a RM50 node, yeah, it's not the same anymore. Okay, the fruits of this uh, species, they have no wings, as you can see in the top photo. And if you cut um, the outer bark and you look at the inner bark, they have this uh, thumbprint-like uh, effect. Okay, next genus is Parashoya. Parashoya, these trees, they have big buttress roots and the trunks, they have this fissured uh, texture and this is deep uh, fissured uh, texture. So they are deep cuts into the tree trunk. The stipules, uh, when they drop, the, the guardian of the leaves, when they drop, they form obvious rings uh, on, on the branch. And the leaf, when you look at the secondary venation, they have quite a steep angle, so less than 35 degrees uh, from the midrib, so from the center of the leaf. And the fruits, there are five wings. So three outer ones and two inner ones with different sizes. Some examples are Parashoya densiflora and Parashoya macrophylla. So in this uh, photo that was taken in, in Sabah, uh, out of these 12 uh, species, only two do not belong uh, to a diptera cup uh, tree group. And out of these uh, 12 species, you can see Parashoya uh, tomentella, this white with this whitish trunk at the front, and you can also find Parashoria malanonan. Okay, next is Upuna. So as I mentioned, Upuna, there is only Upuna burnensis in Borneo. Upuna trees, they have big buttress and the sap wood. So when you cut the outer bark and you look at the inner bark, it's pale yellowish in color. And the leaves, so with the canopy, uh, it's tomentos, meaning um, they have this um, hair. Uh, hair like uh, under in the uh, on the under under part of the leaf 
So from afar, it looks quite whitish. The base of the leaves are chordate uh, in shape, as you can see in the diagram. Okay, now Shoria. So this is a very big uh, genus, which so is the biggest genus in Detora Carpace. And most of these trees, they have fissured bark, and sometimes uh, they are scaly. And some even have ring-like trunk like Shoria macroptera here. So we divide Shoria into 12 sections before we get to the subsections and species. So um, you can see the diagram uh, here uh, of Shoria leprosula. So they are floating, these fruits are floating. So actually these uh, fruits, they are, they are meant to be dispersed by water and not by wind because they are relatively uh, heavy to be dispersed by wind. And on the right, you can see a typical canopy of a Shoya tree, which looks like a cauliflower. Okay, I'll just speak very briefly about section Shoya, subsection Shoya, <clears throat> and another subsection. But there are many other sections um, to cover if I were to go uh, in detail. So for section Shoya, um, glaucus underneath leaf, meaning there is this bluish-like color, and the fruit calyx, there are three long ones. For subsection Shoya, the difference uh, between different subsections are uh, when you look at the fruit. So the fruit buds, as you can see for Shoya materialis here, the fruit buds are quite long. And the flower petals, they are straight and they drop a leaf. So some examples are Shoya colina and brunensis. Sorry, uh, brunensis. And for subsection barbata, the fruits, they are almost round. So they are known as subglobe. And also the flower petals, they are short. So this is how you differentiate these two subsections. Examples are Shoya gauka and Shoya levis. So for Shoya, there are many other examples. Some are, uh, as you can see, this uh, Shoya ovali. So they have these orangey-like uh, fruits. So it's very nice to see uh, the canopy uh, when the fruits are still at this stage. And for Shoya leprosulas, they are known as Meranti tembaga because of the leaf that is a bronzy-like color. So you can see the photo on the right. So it looks like a very expensive leaf because of the bronzy appearance. And if you look at the Shoya leprosula tree from far, as you can see on, in this photo, uh, it looks like a durian tree because of the bronzy canopy. But if it's not durian or other species, then it's most definitely Shoya leprosula. Okay, more examples of Shoya, Shoya krasa, and then you have uh, Shoya parvifolia. So Shoya parvifolia and Shoya leprosula are quite uh, common. And they're actually fruiting now. More examples, uh, Shoya mesistopteryx, uh, another Shoya species. So for Shoya mesistopteryx, if you look at the leaf, so the above and the undersurface and the above surface of the leaf, they have very different color. So if the leaves are dry, you can really look at the difference in between the color as compared to a fresh leaf. Shoya pakifila, they have almost round like a shape, a leaf shape and Shoya hemsliana, they have big leaves. So they are very distinct from each other. And then you have uh, Shoya uh, kurtisi with a cauliflower-like canopy and Shoya foxworthy. So Shoya foxworthy, you can see the three distinct uh, wings, the long, long uh, wings. Then you have Shoya colaris, uh, Shoya venulosa. Okay, now uh, we are in the last genus, the 10th genus, Vatica. So for Vatica, the trunk, they are smooth and the bark, they are thin. Um, there are many sections for Vatica, so I'll only go through section Vatica, subsection Vatica, and also section Sunapte. For section Vatica, um, the, the fruits, they have uh, no wings, but even if they have, they are very small. And the calyx, they curve towards the fruit petio. Examples are Vatica oblongifolia and Vatica sara vacancies. For section Sunapte, as you can see uh, the photo on the right, on the left of Vatica coriace, they have uh, straight wings and they are obvious on fruits, but they are actually quite small. Uh, another example is Vatica nitens. So as you can see uh, in this photo of a Vatica species, the tree trunk is um, just is the texture that we mentioned. It's quite smooth. 
more examples of uh, Vatica species. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. That's all for my presentation. Hamza? Uh, any questions? Thanks, Tash. So going through each one, I hope people had a paper and pen to take notes of everything. Um, so is there any questions from the, um, from the group? Um, please put your questions in the chat box and I'll pick it out for Tashwini. If there's anything clarifications that you need. Um, there's one question from Abdul Rahman, and his question, it's not to do with ID, but basically he's planted a few Hopia odorata, Moranti Tamanipis, and Chengal around his house, and he would like to know how to control the height of the tree and to maintain it around 30 feet to 40 feet instead of allowing it to grow any taller. Can I just cut the trunk to the height I want and will the healthy crown grow back? Well, I think you can prune the trees, but of course you have to um, be careful when you prune uh, the trees because you have to select like the main, you have to determine which is the main trunk and then you have the lateral trunks. So you select the main one and then you start uh, pruning the main one so that the lateral can still grow. So you have to leave room for this other branches to grow as well. Then you can uh, control the height of the tree. There's no problem. But the pruning can be quite tricky uh, because it could uh, sometimes kill the tree. So you have to be very careful when you select which is the main trunk and then which are the secondary uh, branches. Okay, uh, next question from Awang is, can we identify the sampling, sampling, sample or sapling? And at what age of the tree? Uh, this is um, very tricky because as I understand, when the uh, saplings or the seedlings are really, really young, they actually look very different from a big full-grown mother tree. So it can be tricky to identify. Uh, I personally cannot uh, identify up to this level. But of course, there are uh, like, you can look at the stipules. Sorry? Okay, you can look at the stipules uh, firstly, and then you can look at the type of leaf. So if it's simple leaf or uh, compound leaf, and then from there, um, you can narrow down into a certain uh, genus, but to a certain species, I think you will need um, more expertise to really ID up to species level for a very young, young sapling or seedling. So I, I suggest you wait until it's um, a bit grown la, to, to be able to ID based on the trunk, the flowers, the fruits, and leaves. Great. Um, another question from BC Tan is, what are the diptera carps that are flowering now? Have the pattern of flowering changed through the years? And has climate change affected this pattern? Or are there any other factors that affect this? OK, a lot of questions. So for number one, um, I know that uh, the diptera carp trees have been flowering for the past couple of months. And the ones that I see, uh, uh, fruiting now, okay, not flowering fruiting, uh, Shreya leprosula, parvifolia, um, acuminata, um, and dictorocarpus, some dictorocarpus species, um, yeah, and many other uh, species, but of course it's dependent on the locality, like the habitat, right? And the second question was, uh, yeah, it has, I believe that it has changed a lot over the years because, um, Shoya Kutisi, they should be flowering uh, every year, but now it's not this, this is not the case. And for example, there is uh, this Shoya um, Akuminata nearby that should be flowering now, but uh, they are not, some of them are not flowering. So I believe this is because of the proximity to like urban area, which affects the flowering pattern of some dipterocarp uh, species, not some most dipterocarp species. And for the third question, I forgot the third question. <laughs> is, has climate change affected the pattern or are there any other factors that have affected the pattern of flowering? Yeah, I answered this already, the second question. That was it. Okay. Um, I guess I would add on to climate change um, affecting would be like 
because deter deterocarp species between two to seven years is flowering, right? So obviously mm -hmm. changes in weather patterns will, will affect because how, what, what induces the flowering is a period, a very, very dry period, followed by a lot of rain. So if this changes, then it will definitely impact um, the pattern of flowering. Yeah. Uh, next question from Sharon Yo: Is it possible to take cuttings from these trees or is growing from seed a better option for strength of genetics? Um, what, um, what I think is the best method for growing is um, using the seedlings. So this gives a very, very high percentage of survival. Uh, you can also use the seeds, but of course, this will take a very long time, but it's very, very much in use nowadays um, because we know the method of uh, not storing them for too long. And even if we store, we know how to handle them uh, before we germinate them. And um, for cuttings, um, I'm not so sure if it's um, okay to use uh, cuttings because I've never used this method before. But uh, nowadays there is also a tissue culture, uh, which is um, very prevalent in the frame in our forest uh, research institute. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think um, every method uh, should have its advantages and disadvantages. Great. Uh, next question from Mohamed Buhaiki is, can crown shyness be used to identify Dryer Balanops or are there any other genus that exhibit this? I believe it's uh, Dryer Balanops aromatica, yes. You can use this to ID crown shyness. I've never seen other trees of dipterocarp uh, tree that has this um, crown shyness uh, phenomenon. A uh, question from Su Vin. Why aren't these dipterocarp trees grown commercially in our urban setting? Are they more difficult to cultivate? Um, in our cities, it seems, to my layman eyes, very few trees are endemic to our country. Okay, can you please repeat the question? I didn't Why hear. Why aren't these dipterocarp trees grown commercially in our urban settings? Are they more difficult to cultivate? Okay, but actually, there are. Uh, uh, dipterocarp trees being planted in uh, urban settings like in central parks, in uh, gardens. I do find a lot of vatika species, a lot of copia species, shoya species. But um, I think uh, the reason why they're not being planted or commercialized is because, you know, they flower at a very... Um, you cannot predict when they will flower and they, it doesn't happen every year. So for people, if you want to see urban trees, of course, you want to see beautiful flowering trees that would not take so long to grow because dipterocarp trees, they take so, so long to grow because, of course, they are hardwood trees, right? And these are some of the reasons why they're not commercialized. And, of course, um, you need to really know that uh, dipterocarp trees, when they are young, they would require shade. shade. And when they are uh, big enough, uh, then they can reach out to the sun uh, without complete or half uh, shading. So this uh, growth uh, characteristic uh, and their flowering pattern, uh, which gives the aesthetic value, uh, affects the commercialization of this plant group. Lah. But I believe uh, with more research nowadays that's being done and the trees, the literacup trees that I see in urban settings nowadays, I think... Um, more more uh, species can be uh, planted actually in urban settings, but of course more studies are also needed. Uh, yeah, and just to add on to that, yeah. been a lot of the um, dipterocarp species, um, when landscaping wise, you know, a lot of the trees that landscapers use tend to be exotics instead of native. Um, yeah. And as, as people are able to understand better the importance of having native trees, and also as people have more patience, um, in like allowing the trees to grow, you know, whether it's 10 to 30 years, um, there, is, there will be a shift towards making sure that the trees that we plant are native and therefore, you know, a lot of them will be um, from this dipterocarp category. And also previously, obviously, dipterocarps commercially were, were logged for timber, right, the timber trade. So that's like, um, you know, for construction purposes. So as we move away from yeah. that, and instead of like um, commercializing it for timber and then instead commercializing it for carbon capture or carbon sequestration, then you know perhaps we may see more of these trees in urban areas. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I hope I hope this happens too. Thanks so much. Guys. <laughs> Me too. That's what we're all working towards because urban biodiversity is equally as important as diversity and biodiversity in forested areas. Okay. Um, next question from Tenmuli. Any specific animals survive that depend on dipterocarps? Well, 
there are many uh, animal species that um, survive on diptera carp uh, because of uh, the food source that they provide. Um, for example, uh, uh, trips, this uh, insect, they, when these diptera carp trees flower, so these trips, they actually pollinate the flowers, so trips. And then you have ants and rats, as I mentioned, they predate on the seeds. And also not only these two uh, types of animals, of course, there are many other. And then you also have uh, certain primates that, um, that, that uh, use the trees um, to climb and also uh, some species which use as their nesting ground because they are emergent trees. So they grow taller than the canopy layer. So they are emergent, they occupy the emergent layers. So um, not only as food source, so there are as the habitat and as, as a playing ground and for, yeah, mostly for food. Yeah. Yeah. So it's important to note here that, you know, the terracarp species take up 80% of our forest canopy. So therefore they lend themselves to the very structure of our forests. So it's more than just a food source. It's also a habitat for survival for wildlife. Um, question from Kyrena. How long does it take for these species to become mature? How about the carbon intake of these species? So uh, for them to um, mature, um, um, for a seedling to grow, it would take um, many years, like more than five years. But for them to start uh, flowering, so maturing meaning they start to flower, um, I think it will be from... Uh, I think it would take, it depends really on the species. So as far as I know, like some species take um, more than seven years to start uh, flowering, but this is really uh, species uh, dependent. And also, as we mentioned, it's uh, the climatic uh, factors that affect uh, when they start to uh, flower. Uh, and the second question. Um, how about the carbon intake of these species? Well, the carbon intake, uh, I'm not so sure, um, like how much are they this, the carbon amount that is sequestered, but since they grow very slowly because they add up this mass into their wood because they are hardwood species. So I believe the carbon sequestration level should be higher than your normal primary uh, or secondary forest uh, species, but the exact value, I'm not so sure. Okay, question from HY. How do we go and collect seeds with the travel restrictions in place? Well, you have to, uh, if you want to enter like forest reserves, then you have to, of course, apply. Like if you want to apply to a forest reserve in Selangor, then you write uh, an official letter to Jabatan Perhutanan Negeri Selangor to ask for permission, what you want to do, when you want to do, how you want to carry out this activity. And then once you get approval, then you can apply for forestry permit from the respective uh, district uh, forestry office. Yeah, I believe this is the procedure. It is indeed. Um, so definitely get permits if you are taking anything out of forest reserves. Obviously, if you see a diptera carp species like on the roadside that is not in the forest, then I think if that's flowering, it's fine. But if you're collecting anything from forest reserves, um, it would be best to do that on the legal side of things. Um, for a question from Ki Yao Yu from NUS. Good morning, Tash. Um, have there been any advances mm -hmm. in seed storage technology such that um, the, the seeds of diptera carbs can be stored for longer period of times? Um, Masting seems to be producing a lot of seeds, but there may not be enough resources to germinate them all at once. Um so far, what I know is um, there are no basic like uh, uh, facilities or technology to store the seeds because they are they will uh, become not viable after a few few days to uh, just a few weeks. But um, for uh, storage facilities, I believe there are high tech storage facilities to keep the moisture level at that desired uh, within the desired uh, range. But I'm not so sure what is this called. <laughs> Maybe even liquid uh, nitrogen, I'm not so sure if uh, this works as well to store the seeds. Yeah, one of the greatest challenges of um, the diptera carp species is the fact that their seeds are recalcitrant. So storage is very difficult. So at TRCRC, our general protocol is to germinate them immediately. 
um, within within days, few days of collection. So hence why we have uh, tropical rainforest living collections that lends itself to um, safeguarding the endangered species because that's how, that's the best way, um, the best protocol that that maintains the highest level of survivability for these seeds. Um, question from Pei Sin Su. Since diptera carp have poor seed dispersal, how does masting help the tree's population to continue to survive and grow? Okay, this is a very good question. <laughs> um, so how masting helps uh, when they have poor seed dispersal? Um, so um, as I mentioned, uh, these seeds, they have uh, these advantages of being predated. And so this will of course reduce uh, the number of seeds that are viable for germination in the forest. And also they, have, they cannot travel too far from the mother tree because if they can travel very far, for example, if you have a, a secondary forest and then you have a climax forest right next to it and you have this climax forest filled with uh, many diplocarp trees, but even though the uh, secondary forest that is now regenerating to become a primary forest is just next door, but because it's too far, the seeds cannot travel this distance, this much distance to occupy the prime, uh, secondary forest, uh, which will eventually become the primary forest. So to occupy this forest to help this forest to regenerate into a big climate forest because of this disadvantage. So when you have the masting period, the trees of a certain habitat, uh, so the species of in this habitat, they start to flower at the same time. So this will increase the number of uh, seeds that land on the ground. So even though they are eaten by uh, insects and viable seed number decreases at rapidly, there will still be many other seeds which are still viable because all these different individuals of these same species, they start to flower at the same time. So it's not like one tree and then all the seeds are eaten. So you have like 10 different trees in this habitat and you have high number of seeds that will definitely um, allow some or many uh, seeds to germinate, okay, in this uh, habitat. So this is how masting helps uh, with these two disadvantages that I mentioned. Yeah, and, and also to add to that, so these challenges that we face with diptera crop species to regenerate from primary forest um, to climax forest is basically um, why human intervention is needed, right? So let's say a tree produces a thousand seeds because of the predation from, ant, from insects, um, from pigs, um, the survivability of all the seeds that, that fall during a masting season is also already very low. So not only is the distance is a challenge, but also the survival um, because they get predated on. So this is why human intervention is um, needed and why TRCRC works to um, collect the seeds, germinate them in our nurseries to increase the survivability and therefore, and then plant it back um, in similar forest compositions. Um, so last question for today um, is, is, I'm gonna combine two questions in one because they're both related to planting in urban areas. So they're asking which of the species have adapted to be suited to plant within urban area? Um, and is it safe to plant in urban area um, in case of light pollution? Safe for the trees or you mean for the trees? Yeah, deter crops in urban, in urban areas. Okay, so um, some of, uh, so I don't remember the species, but genus that I've seen is in, uh, in a botanical garden. So I've seen uh, Vatica, uh, Hopia species, but I don't remember the species now. Um, and in a, a park, like in an open park, I've seen a lot of uh, these special Hopia species that uh, survives very well and it's doing very well. Um, and for in terms of pollution, of course, it will definitely affect the trees. Um, but um, I, I know that there are some, there are many tree species which can actually help to lower down pollution level because of uh, they they can they have the ability to trap dust because of the hairy uh, under undergrowth um, or. Um, they, they are able to uh, sequester uh, some uh, heavy metals. Um, but this depends, uh, of course, on the researches that are being done on diptera cup trees. Lah. Because I know that there are many researches done on non diptera cup trees on how they, they are able to trap all these pollutants in an urban area because these trees have been planted in these urban areas for a very long time. But since not many diptera cup trees are planted in urban areas, so you know, for this case, uh, we have to look at different studies on how diptera cups help to 
uh, lower down pollution level without actually harming the trees uh, themselves. Yeah, another thing to add to that as well is, you know, when you're planting the terracrop species, um, something to highlight that Tashwini mentioned already earlier is that when you're planting a sapling, they, in the early stages of their growth, you, they can't be exposed to direct sunlight. Um, so they basically um, has, the method of planting is also really important because if you are exposing it um, without shade, then it's likely that the mortality will be quite high. Okay, well, thanks everyone for the really, really interesting questions. Um, thank you, Tashwini, for a really great presentation. Um, I hope that people um, were able to learn a lot. Um, can you go to the next slide, Tash, please? Yeah, so please um, stay in touch um, if you are looking to um, join our mailing list for more future programs in Almina. We'll be doing a lot more programs um, as the time comes. Um, I would also like to make an announcement for our next webinar that's coming up. So that's next week, we'll be covering seedling care and nursery management. So if you are interested to learn how to look after diptera cup seedlings, because obviously they, the care for this will be very different and they are a little bit more sensitive. Um, so we'll be covering that together with Benny Tuzan. So he's the um, Tropical Rainforest Living Collection Project Manager in Mersuli Sabah. Um, so he's got you know, a lot more experience um, with seedling care and nursery flow uh, and the nursery management there. So they have successfully done this for quite a number of years now. So if you're interested to join, um, that's going to be next week. So it's same time next week, 20th of August, and he'll be doing a knowledge sharing on basic nursery operations of diptera cups and rainforest trees. Um, I'll be sending out this link um, to, um, to everyone who's attended today um, and hopefully see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Love your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all. Appreciate it very much. Very interesting. Thanks, Ms. Ms. Tashwini. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very good presentation, Ms. Tashwini. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tashwini. Afza. Thank you. Razat says, yesterday was our 14 days after second dose. Woohoo, let's go into the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy want to go come well. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to end the call now. Mm -hmm.